well, just based on the satellite imagery, you can see we have a lot to talk about when it comes to today's update and forecast on all the wildfires going on in Northern California. Big one we're going to be talking about and really spending the most time on is the Dixie Fire here. You can see just how active that was throughout the day today, especially on that northwestern edge of the fire. And then the area around Greenville really started to pick up in fire intensity around 4 o'clock today. So we're going to look at the updates that have already happened, as well as that ongoing red flag warning, which is partly responsible for some of these tricky conditions and the extreme fire behavior that we've seen over the last 48 hours and unfortunately will be continuing for the next 24 hours as that red flag warning stays in place and we do continue to have some very critical fire weather conditions. Now you can see a number of other fires going on as well too so there's really a large number of fires we're going to try to dive into throughout this video so first will be the Dixie fire then we'll have to look at all these lightning fires that started around the 29th and the 30th when we had that monsoonal moisture coming in from Arizona started a number of these lightning fires and since a lot of our resources were occupied with the Dixie fire and some other fires going on across the state and there was a large number of new lightning fire start starts here it just gave them the time they needed to really start to take off. It was just waiting for that hot, dry, windy conditions to come in to mix with the critically dry fuels. And you can see that those have really started to take off over the last 48 hours as well. So over here, we will be diving into the McFarland fire, the Monument fire, the Summer fire, the Hay Press fire. And then up very in the northern parts of California, we have the Antelope fire to talk about too. And then the new one on the map, we talked about all of those yesterday, but the new one to talk about is what you see pop up right down on the very bottom of this figure. That new smoke plume coming off, that is called the River Fire. That one really picked up in intensity throughout the day today and I believe is leading to some new evacuation warnings as well, so we'll have to take a close look at that. And I believe on all of these fires, we have some new evacu evacuation orders in place, so going to be very important to dive into what's already happened, look at the fire weather forecast to see what might happen throughout the day tomorrow as we continue to have some critical fire conditions, and then also look at when we might finally start to see a, a little bit relief, but unfortunately it looks like the fuels, which is one of the big factors driving all this activity, those are going to be remaining ex uh, extremely dry. So. Well, the end, end is not in sight anytime soon when it comes to the 2021 fire season. Now, one other thing we can do before we move on to just look at the Dixie Fire, good way to actually see where these fires are popping up is by looking at the natural color fire imagery, and you can really see that northwestern section of the Dixie Fire. That's the first thing that I really notice on this map. Second thing I notice is that river fire really starting to flare up there around 4 o'clock today. And then even in the overnight hours, this when you see that map turn black, that says the sun drops and it turns into the overnight hours. And you can see that we're still seeing a large amount of activity on the Dixie Fire, the McFarland Fire, the Monument Fire, Summer and Hay Press Fires, the Antelope Fire. Lots of activity still going on. And I think that's the big story throughout the night tonight is relative humidity is going to remain very low, which means, which means it's not going to help our firefighters all that much that it's nighttime. Winds will come down, which is a big factor, but it will remain extremely dry, so we will continue to see some activity overnight, which means you'll most likely be waking up to some more smoke in the morning. But again, before I go any farther, I will just remind you there are a number of new evacuation orders in place. I believe there's been some recent developments of this fire. You can see that northeastern section of the Dixie Fire right there really picked up around 4 o'clock today and the last report I could find said that the, the fire had re-entered Greenville and there was a number of people who, although there was an evacuation order in place, stayed around and right now the problem the firefighters are having is they're working on getting everybody out of the town instead of actually being able to protect the structures. So that's probably the top priority right now. If you are around any of these fires, check the most recent evacuation orders and if you're under them, the, it really helps firefighters and your own safety to take those evacuation orders seriously. But now let's actually just dive into the Dixie Fire and we'll actually just start on this map again. You can see earlier in the day we already started out with a lot of activity. A lot of that was continued from the last 48 hours when 
this fire really started to flare up again. I'll remind you with the Dixie fire last Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we were looking great. We had some good containment around the fire. There was a lot of successful firing operations going on where they're clearing all, out a lot of the fuels. We even had that round of thunderstorms that brought some sprinkles to the area. It, it seemed like everything was working in our favor. And then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we've just seen this trend of more critical fire weather conditions where it's hotter, it's drier, it's windier. And then the big story both today and th for the day tomorrow is that ongoing red flag warning event as the winds pick up and you can see the effect that that has on those fires, especially when those winds pick up in the afternoon, you can really start to see the smoke coming off that satellite imagery there. And then again, if we just look at the color fire, you can see how active this fire is remaining even into the overnight hours and how active that was on the northwestern side of the fire earlier today and then in that Greenville area as well. That's about as active as the Dixie fires looked in over a week. So from Tuesday to Sunday, we really didn't see all that much extreme activity on this last week, but in the last 48 hours, we've certainly seen activity pick up on the Dixie fire. So if we actually wanna see what it looks like, you can see it started out, we started out in the day with already seeing some activity. It was able to continue through the overnight hours last night because relative humidity stayed very low. And then as we saw this afternoon, you're gonna see the winds pick up on this camera here in a second. You can see that when the smoke plume starts to get a little flatter, it's not able to go as high because the winds are just blowing it sideways very fast. And part of the reason for that, we have the low pressure system moving through this area which was what caught, was part of the reason that red flag warning popped up as we were getting some wind gusts up to 25 to 35 miles per hour combined with the temperatures in the mid 90s and relative humidity in the single digits. If we wanna see that from another angle, you can actually see a couple of those pyrocumulus clouds pop up here. You might wonder what that is. It's basically if you see the top of one of these smoke columns, you almost see a white puffy appearance. It almost looks like a thunderstorm. And a, that's a good indication that you're seeing some extreme fire activity. And the big thing that I always think about when you see just how active these plumes are is if you have all that rising air, it can't just create a vacuum on the surface. It means that something has to fill in to take the place of all that rising air. So that's where you get erratic, gusty winds around the fire. And then that's where you see some really extreme fire behavior. And that's when it gets very hard to control as well. Now, one other thing that I think about when you see a smoke plume like this is it's actually so hot in this plume that that's how those embers that are picked up or burning twigs or burning leaves, they're actually able to stay on fire as they travel in this plume. And that's why one of the big problems that we've been having with the Dixie fire are those spot fires. And a big part of that reason is that you can just see all the energy that would be picking up these burning embers throwing them out ahead of this major blaze and starting new little fires. And that's actually a good way to transition to the fire perimeter map because that really tells the story of how the Dixie fire turned around. Again, last Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we were looking good. I actually didn't even do videos on Friday and Saturday because for the last two days, we'd really seen no new activity in our fires and everything basically looked like it was going well. But then the big thing that turned around you can see this area right there where you see all those hot spots on the northern section of this fire. That on Saturday and Sunday was unburnt fuel. So it was like this little pocket of unburnt fuel. So was, you think about that, that's a lot of fuel that can provide more energy to this fire if it starts getting going. And that's exactly what happened throughout, especially the day yesterday and a little the afternoon before that. There was this pocket of unburnt fuel, and when we got the hotter conditions, we were in the mid-90s, relative humidity, down into the low teens to even single digits, that area of unburnt fuels flared back up again, created one of those plumes that we've been looking at on these live images right there, where it was able to take some of those burning embers and it tossed it out over the previous containment lines. The containment lines where we were feeling confident in the past that it was going to really control this fire. They had some very successful firing operations on this northern edge here. But what ended up happening was because that unburnt fuel had so much energy when, it's, when it got hotter and drier, that 
that smoke plume was able to carry some of those burning embers over those containment lines. And then now you can see what's happened on this northern section of the fire. Lots of activity. Whenever you see those yellow dots right there, that's where the satellites are picking up a very large heat signature. So you can see that while that was an area that was previously considered, I, I don't think they ever had it officially as contained, but we were certainly confident about it because we had a, basically a firing operation that went all the way around this northern border where they had when the conditions were favorable, like when we got some of the, that late rain with the thunderstorms, they burnt out a whole strip of these fuels here so that when the fire came up to it, there'd be no fuels and then theoretically it would just stop. Now that looked like it was going to work and then again, we had the spot fires jump over that fire line and that's what's been causing all of that activity we've continued to see here. And if we go back to the satellite imagery, you can see what direction the smoke plume is going. It's going from straight south to north. So that tells you that the winds are blowing from south to north as well. And that is, gives you a good idea of why the northern side of this fire has been so active because we continue to see those winds pushing that fire forward. And I'll actually show an animation that could help illustrate that point if it didn't make too much sense. But first I wanna go to the other main priority on this fire right now. That is the Greenville area. You can see all those hot spots around this, around this area. I believe it was two evenings ago. We had some new flare-ups here, a couple of spot fires, just like we were seeing on that northern section there. And it was that basically took an area that was considered relatively controlled and we were confident about it in the past. And that fire got back into got into the area of Greenville. They had to evac new evacuation orders, had to work on structure protection. And then throughout this afternoon, we've really seen the activity pick back up in Greenville. And yesterday's update, it was actually some good news for Greenville. It looked like the fire was actually moving away from Greenville for a number of hours before my update yesterday. But in the most recent update I could find on the Dixie fire, they were saying that the fire has officially moved back into Greenville. And one of the big problems that they're having right now, you can actually see some of those hotspots and again just because the fire perimeter might be over Greenville that doesn't mean that everything underneath that perimeter has burned it just means that's the extent of where those heat signatures have gone in the past it certainly doesn't mean everything inside here is burned but throughout the last couple of hours the most recent report I could find did say that 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 fire activity did move back into the town of Greenville and unfortunately there's a large number of people who chose to stay even though there was that evacuation order put in place. So as of right now, the report I was reading was saying that they weren't able to focus on structure protection as much because they were currently so worried about just getting people to safety. Again, that's good priorities. People are always the first thing that we should look out for, both civilians and firefighters, never wanna get them in dangerous situations. But it is, it is a testament to the importance of taking evacuation orders seriously because now they're not able to protect structures as much because they are working on getting people out of the area. But the good news is typically winds calm down during the overnight hours. So hopefully we'll see some of that activity come down. Although the bad news is it looks like we're going to have another dry night tonight. So we will likely see some of that activity continue throughout the overnight hours as relative humidity remains low. And then unfortunately, we still have that red flag warning in place tomorrow. So we're it, the fight is certainly not over when it comes to the Dixie fire. And when it comes to that northern end there where we're seeing a lot of new activity, it almost seems like a whole new fight up there and in that Greenville area as well. Now, I know I just said a lot of bad things, so let's focus on some of the good news. You can see that southern edge of the fire, which again, that was originally the top priority on this fire because they really didn't want to get it into the areas of places like Concow and Paradise. But you can see, if we zoom in there, basically no hot spots remaining on that southern edge. Looking great down there. You do see a little activity right there. That has been causing some troubles for firefighters over the last 48 hours, but they said they expect to get some good control on that over the next 48 hours. And then over here, that's where we did have a spot fire jump there, but most recent report I could find, they said that that was still within, while it jumped one control line, they said it was still within 
a number of other containment lines. So not looking too critical there. And you can just see if you compare the hotspots of that area compared against the hotspots of this northern edge, you can pretty clearly see which is the high priority part of the fire right now. Again, it's that northern edge and that north eastern finger right there around Greenville where we've seen the most activity over the last 48 hours and unfortunately with the ongoing red flag warning and the tricky conditions most likely going to see that continued activity you can see you can see that another way very well by looking at this map where it really shows where that bright red color is that's where this fire has been burning the most actively over the last 24 hours and I always like to show this map because you're actually able to click on the structures as well so we can see where the high priority areas of this fire are. Again, I would say the top areas that I'm concerned about right now, again, where the fire is the most active and where we have the most structures. So you can see if I turn it off and on, you can see where a lot of those structures are. It looks like we do have a large amount of structures on this northwestern section of where we're seeing a lot of activity right there. A large amount of structures just north of this of this area where the fire seems to be actively burning and right around Lake Almanor as well right there which looks relatively close to where we see that activity now again two things I'll say there one clearly the all of these areas are under evacuation orders right now I'll show the evacuation order map in a second but don't really even need to see it to understand that there would be evacuation orders in these places and I know this looks like the entire fire is just going to over overrun these entire areas with all of these with a really large amount of structures but the good news is is we still have over 4,000 4,500 I, I don't we can actually we'll look at the exact number in a second here but we have a large large amount of resources still in this fire and as we've seen with all the fires throughout California the work that our firefighters are able to do always amazes me and a great example of that was the Tamarack fire this year that northeastern finger of that fire was going right actually we can we can just zoom over to it for a second because I, I know we've been talking about a lot of kind of rather scary things so far in this video and I know that map just shows how close the Dixie fire is to a lot of those structures but I just want to show the Tamarack fire because it is a testament to how amazing our firefighters are you can see how close the northern section of this fire got to this large amount of structures and the firefighters were able to just stop it in its tracks then it happened again on this northeastern section there it looked like the entire fire was about to just completely surround these structures and just overtake the area and you can see how they were able to provide that great structure protection and then the same thing there on that northeastern side this was an area of the fire that was growing about 10,000 acres a day and they just stopped it in its tracks right before it got to the largest amount of structures but with that being said we are still seeing some very active behavior on the Dixie fire and unfortunately the conditions are going to be rather difficult throughout the day tomorrow as that red flag warning remains in place so we are going to have to keep a close eye on that one especially over the next 24 hours as we do have some very challenging conditions now if we actually want to see how the fire interacts with the winds i know i, I always talk about how the fire interacts with the weather and i think this is a great way to look at it one thing I, w I always say before I show this is this is an experimental forecast only. We run this out of the San Jose State Fire Weather Research Laboratory and it basically shows how the fire perimeter interacts with the temperature, winds, humidity, how the smoke plume will actually create its own weather and then interact with the fire as well. It's one of the top wildfire simulation models in the world and while the experimental forecast only the important thing to reference there is it doesn't take into account everything I was just talking about about the amazing work firefighters do to protect our structures but this does show you how a, it's a good simulation for how this fire interacts with the winds so that's always why I like to show this even though occasionally it'll show more fire activity than we're actually going to see because it doesn't take into account the fire suppression tactics but you can see why the northern edge of this fire has been so active. So as I turn this on, actually we'll go back to early in the morning 
where you can see most of the winds are actually down the Feather River Canyon. You get down canyon winds at nighttime, and then as this transitions to around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, you see those winds shift around, and as they shift around, if you zoom in on one of those areas on the northern edge, you can actually see how, the, how those southerly winds act to push the fire forward, and that's why we've seen most of our new activity on the northern edges of this fire. It works exactly like that. The winds just push the fire forward, and then it also can lead to spot fires as well. If we were able to really slow this down, we might even be able to see where a new ember was dropped out ahead of the fire, a spot fire, because the winds were carrying it, and then it just reattaches with the major blaze, leads to some new rapid fire spread. So again, that's part of the reason. I think it's just a good simulation for why we've seen so much activity on the northern edges of our fire. But again, experimental forecast only, just because this is showing large amounts of future growth in the forecast, doesn't exactly mean that's exactly what's going to happen. So when it comes to the numbers for the Dixie Fire, you can see big updates since yesterday. We're now up to 278,000 acres and containment stayed the same from yesterday. No surprise there as we've seen a lot of activity. And as the, if you think about this almost in a math kind of way, as the acreage increases, your percent containment would go down because the overall perimeter is getting larger if you didn't add any new containment. That's one interesting thing that I'd never really thought about that I heard someone say a couple of weeks ago and thought it was a fairly good point to point out. So that we might have gained some containment in some individual places, but because the fire grew so much over the last 24 hours, percent containment stayed at 35%. Now, I think the big thing to reference here is all those evacuation orders that are in place, especially in the Greenville area, where as I'm speaking, they're working on getting people out of that, out of that area because the fire has moved in over the last few hours. So the link for this in, is in the description if you want to read these paragraphs. I've talked about a lot of what, a lot of what they're saying throughout those paragraphs right there, but I really wanna just go down here and look at some of the numbers that we have on this fire. That one has stayed the same over the last 24 hours, so no update there, still 67 structures destroyed, but unfortunately, given how, how much activity we've seen on the northern sections of this fire, and it looks like it's getting closer and closer to a large amount of structures, and as we're seeing in the Greenville area right now, they're more focused on getting people out than actual structure protection. So it'll we'll have to keep our eye on this throughout the day tomorrow. For, I'll definitely focus on this in tomorrow's forecast. And as always, my thoughts and prayers go out to everybody who has been affected by these wildfires. Now, again, there's this is where the good news always comes in. And this ties into what I was talking about earlier about how just the amazing work our firefighters do where it looks like there is just no hope. It looks like the fire is just going to overtake a large number of structures. And it's amazing what our firefighters can do. And they've got a lot of resources to work with. You can see along with the aircraft that are on this fire, we have 24 helicopters, 341 engines, 61 dozers, 103 water tenders, 4,785 personnel, and 82 crews. So still a large number of resources on this fire. One thing you might notice is that the number of personnel has gone down from what it was yesterday. Yesterday we were still over 5,000 personnel on this fire and to explain that I probably just need to show the satellite imagery again. Again we have the McFarland fire, the Monument fire, the Summer fire, the Haypress fire, the Antelope fire, and now as you've seen throughout this afternoon, River fire really starting to kick up as well. So they're having to distribute some of those resources because that it's kind of the same problem we had in 2020 where you have so many large fires going on that it becomes very difficult to prioritize the resources and it, it just becomes, we get spread thin. So that's why last year especially we saw a lot of those fires grow so out of control is because there was, I believe, over 300 fires all started with that lightning storm, so guaranteed some of those were going to grow out of control because there just weren't enough resources to take on all of them. So again, 
That right there is part of the reason the resources have actually decreased a little from yesterday's look at the Dixie fire because you can see a large amount of other fires going on as well. Now, you might have thought about where we are on the top 20 largest California wildfires list as that number got updated. Yesterday, I believe we were around 11, and you can see we have jumped up to the number 8 spot. Again, we're at 274,000 acres burned, and unfortunately, given the ongoing activity, I would imagine the next time they update this number, we'll actually jump the Thomas fire and take over the number 7 spot for largest wildfires in the recorded history of California. But after that, again, I, I was just talking about the 2020 season. You can see out of the top five, one, two, three, four, and or five out of the top six fires were in 2020. So if you need some kind of silver lining, I always try to find it somewhere. We're still in, at least not where we were in 2020. And we got through that season, so it makes you think we'll be able to get through this one as well. So now let's actually look at how this, what's been causing all this activity on the Dixie Fire and how it's likely to change throughout the next 24 hours. Again, the big story here is that there's still a red flag warning in place. This was part of the reason it started to flare back up again. We had this high pressure system over California, warm temperatures, very dry air. And then what's caused a lot of the concern over the last 24 hours and over the next 24 hours is this little low pressure system that you see moving through. It's a cold front, which brings some gusty winds, and you might think that would be good news because it would possibly bring, you always think cold front or low pressure system, you might think rain, but unfortunately, there's a lot of dry air actually associated with this. They're calling it a dry cold front. So no rain associated with it, but actually just seeing some gustier winds as that moves through. You can really see that based on, I'll try not to get too sciencey here, but where you see, these are called isobars, lines of constant pressure, where they're very far apart, like where you see over Utah and Colorado and Wyoming, you would have very weak winds right there. How you could think of this is if you had just a flat tray and you poured some water on it and just slightly tilted it, the water would slowly creep down the tray. That's what the winds look like where those isobars are very far apart. Now where those isobars get very close together, you can imagine that's just like tilting the tray. It means that the atmosphere is almost tilted, so those winds are able to go a lot faster, just like the water would go faster the more you tilted that tray. So whenever you see the lines close together like that, it gives you a good idea that you're seeing some stronger winds as well. So that's been a big, part of why we have that red flag warning right now and what's continuing to cause that red flag warning throughout the day tomorrow. So if we actually want to see that low pressure system come in, you can see it drops in right about there and you can see what I was talking about how even though it's a low pressure system, lots of dry air associated with it. Sometimes when a low pressure system comes in, all of California will just turn blue and green, lots of moisture, but you can see that especially over directly over a lot of our fires like the Dixie fire. As that low pressure system goes through right there, you can see it based on the center of it, that circle there up in Oregon. Looks like antelope fire might be able to actually pick up some of that moisture, but where the Dixie fire is and a lot of those other fires in Northern California, still seeing that dry air. Now, some good news, it looks like there's a quick flash of some moisture late Thursday night, so we should actually start to see some recoveries, especially for the more western fires in Northern California Thursday night. But again, the big story is strong winds associated as that goes through while we still have warm temperatures and low relative humidity. So if we actually want to see what that looks like on the map, and this will you'll really be able to see why we've seen a large amount of our fire growth on the northern edges of our fire as we click through here. You can see as that low pressure system started to go through this afternoon, you can see how the winds just jumped up. We had some gusts up to 25 to 35 miles per hour. And if you look really closely, you can actually see that they're coming from a southerly and southwesterly direction. So makes sense why we've seen most of our growth on the northern and northeastern sides of this fire as those winds just continue to push the flames forward. Now, if we want to see what happens throughout the overnight hours, this is what I was talking about where there's actually some good news, especially for the area of Greenville, which is one of my major concerns right now. 
Dur during the overnight hours, those winds usually calm down and in some cases switch direction, which would blow the fire back into what is already burned. But the bad news is that low pressure system is still making its way through California throughout tomorrow afternoon. So we're actually going to be expected to see even gustier winds throughout tomorrow afternoon. You can see it looks like it's coming from a more westerly direction, at least compared to what we we're seeing today. But the big story there is that it's going to be gusty. That if just this kind of random point I picked, I tried to pick it around relatively the area around Greenville, but right there that shows 36 mile per hour wind gusts, which means in some of the drainages and canyons, you'll have some gusts over 40 miles per hour. And then again, the big thing that concerns me is we'll be combining those strong wind gusts with some relatively warm temperatures slightly going down. That's part of the good news is as that cold front comes through, it does bring our temperatures down a little bit, but relative humidity about as dry as you'll ever see it in the single digits right there. So big story is we're combining that dry air with those gusty winds. That's exactly what you don't want to see when you're already seeing a large amount of fire activity. So this is always a great way to look at those fire weather variables that we always talk about. Again, temperature, pretty self-explanatory. The warmer it is, the worse your wildfires are going to be. Winds are very bad because it can just push that fire forward. It can provide more oxygen to the fire. And what has seemed to play the largest role for the Dixie fires, it leads to spot fires as well. And then when it comes to humidity, the reason that's important is the drier the air is, the dr the drier the air is, the drier the fuels get, and then the more likely it is for that fire to continue to spread, and the more likely it is for any spot fires that have that have started to actually ignite and turn into their own new major blazes. So big things I notice on this map: one, how much cooler we're going to be throughout the day tomorrow. So that's actually some good news there. Th today we're still seeing some temperatures in the mid 90s, but Looks like as that cold front comes through, we'll be dropping down into the low 80s, but then it looks like on Friday we jump back up into the low 90s. Now, there's so there's some good and bad news. Good news for tomorrow is cooler temperatures. Bad news for tomorrow is you can see those wind gusts, still a big factor. As we saw in that other maps, in some places expecting some gusts over 35 miles per hour, and especially in the afternoon hours, which... We saw how that played out throughout the day today. As those winds picked up, you could just really see that plume start to take off. So again, that's going to be the big thing I'm looking at tomorrow is those wind gusts picking up in the afternoon while we have relative humidity in the low teens to even the single digits. And then one other thing I notice on this map is I talked about this a little bit throughout the forecast already is we don't get that great of rel of relative humidity recoveries in the overnight hours. Ideally, we'd like to see this jump up to 60, 70%. Firefighters could really get some control on the blaze, but over the last two days, it's really been remaining dry 24 hours a day. But again, the big thing in the fire weather forecast, we'll, we'll deal with Friday when it comes to it. For the time being, we'll just focus on tomorrow. The I'm mostly worried about those wind gusts in the afternoon combined with that low relative humidity combined with the extreme fire activity we've already been seeing. So I think I'm I'm planning on doing a extended update tomorrow afternoon. So I usually try to make these videos about 30 to 40 minutes. That's clearly not going to happen today as I've already spent about 30 minutes on the Dixie fire alone and we still have about five other fires to get to. But tomorrow afternoon, I'm going. I'm planning on doing a very extended update on the Dixie Fire to really cover this event in real time as those winds pick up in the afternoon. We possibly will be seeing some new evacuation orders, and it will be combined with that dry air as well as that red flag warning remains over the area. So again, if you want to stay updated for that one, you can always subscribe to this channel or you can click the notification bell as well so you'll actually get an update when I go live tomorrow. So no surprise there, that red flag warning will be continuing throughout the day tomorrow. That's, I say it's no surprise because we still have those wind gusts with that extremely low relative humidity, about as critical fire weather conditions as you're ever going to see. And the reason again, that's important, easier fire, that's the possibility for easier fire starts and the potential for rapid spread of new and existing fires. So tomorrow afternoon is my top priority and the main thing that I'm looking at and thinking about as we move forward with the Dixie Fire. 
But actually, the main thing I'm thinking about right now is still the current evacuation orders are in place, especially in the area around Greenville, where, again, the last report I found over the last couple of hours, the fire had moved back into Greenville, and they're currently working on getting people out. So I put the link for this in the description where you can access the most recent uh, evacuation map, because I don't know, by the time you're... By, by how this fire has been going the last 48 hours, by the time you're watching this video, this evacuation map may have changed. So that's where, again, I suggest you go into the description and find the most recent map right there. But again, just to summarize the Dixie Fire, it's been a very unfortunate turn of events over the last few days. Last Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we were looking great with the Dixie Fire. And then as it got hotter, as it got drier, as those winds started to pick up, you can see the fire activity picked up as well, and given the critical fire weather conditions we have throughout the day tomorrow, I, I'm unfortunately forecasting continued extreme fire behavior on the Dixie Fire, so we'll have to keep a close eye on it throughout the day tomorrow. I'll be certainly watching it very closely, and hopefully I'll be able to do a forecast much earlier in the day tomorrow. I imagine some people are probably already going to sleep right about now, so... Tomorrow, I'm planning on actually doing it in the peak hours of the day where we're really going to see this fire activity start to pick up so I can cover that in real time. So, <laughs> spent a bit more time on the Dixie Fire than I, was, than I was originally planning to, but there's a lot of updates going on there, so I really wanted to make sure we covered everything. So, now we'll do a much briefer overview of some of the other fires going on in California. You can see... A large amount of smoke coming off of the more northwestern section of the state. Again, this is a lot of lightning fires that started on the 29th and the 30th. And because we have so many resources dedicated to other fires already going on, it allowed some of those smaller fires to really pick up, take advantage of the hot, dry conditions and the record low fuels in the area. And you can see how much activity is having is happening on those fires as of right now. Again, we have the McFarland fire, the Monument fire, the Summer fire, the Haypress fire, and the Antelope fire as well. And then finally, we'll mention the River fire down here. I'll mention that last because as of right now, there's still not that much information I can find coming out about that one. So that's a big one. I'll do a full update on that one tomorrow as more information comes out. But first, let's just look at the natural fire color on these to see how active they still look even as we get into the overnight hours, you can see antelope fire much more active throughout the day today than we were seeing yesterday. That actually looks like one of the more active fires throughout California. And it almost is comparable to that northwestern section of the Dixie Fire, which based on those live cameras we were seeing was just a large amount of activity. But you also see where those other spots are. Again, I believe this most the most southern one is the McFarland Fire, the one just north of that is the monument and then those two fires right next to each other that look to be a little on the smaller side are the summer fire and then the hay press fire above that antelope fire all the way up there so lots of different fires going on if we actually want to zoom in and see what these fires look like we can zoom into the mcfarland fire first and you can see some of the towns around here Wildwood, I think, is the big concern right now. The I believe there's an evacuation warning in place, and you can see that, I would say, if we had to draw a silver lining on this one, again, that's a hard thing to do because it's basically been doubling in size every single day. If we look at, eh, it never really works to click on, oh, 21,000 acres with 7% containment. So it seems like every time we look at this one, it is almost doubling in size. If we, and again, Wildwood is one of the key areas for this fire that I'm concerned about because you can see how close that is to the northern edge. If we have to draw some silver lining though, it looks like the majority of the activity over the last 24 hours was on that northwestern side of the fire there where you see a lot of those hot spots outside of the previous day's perimeter and on that southeastern edge as well. Again, wherever you see hot spots outside of the previous day's fire activity, previous day's fire perimeter, that gives you a good idea of where it's currently growing the most, where you see those hotspots continuing to extend. And just based on how far away those are from the, the fire perimeter yesterday, gives you a good idea of the activity we're seeing with spot fires, where some of these burning embers are picked up and continue to spread this fire further. 
So if we actually want to look at the numbers right there, we see 21,000 acres, 7% contained. Again, I put the link in the description for this if you want to access the most recent information about all the evacuation orders. Again, right there, you can see, I'll just highlight that for right now. Evacuation orders are in place for the community of Wildwood. Again, that's the one just north of this fire that we're looking on the map right there. So again, when it comes to this one, I believe they've gotten some an increase in resources over the last 24 hours, up to 538 personnel, 7% containment, and if you, I won't read all of this because there's just a large amount of information here, but the one thing that they really focus on throughout a lot of this report is how critical the fire weather is. So that's hot, dry, windy, a lot of the big things we look at can combined with some unstable conditions. But the big thing that they talk about a lot is how dry the fuels are in this area. And that's one of the factors that has allowed this fire to grow as fast as it has. We've had the hot, dry, windy conditions. We have very steep terrain and we're combining that with some record dry fuel. So part of the reason for that, you can look at the drought monitor for California, about 85% of California is in that extreme drought category. We only received about 50% of our average rainfall throughout most of California last year, and the winter before that wasn't all that great either. So we've really had two bad winters in a row where we've seen just fuels, our reservoirs, our creeks drying out more and more. The creek right where right near where I live is personally the lowest I've ever seen it in my lifetime. And part of the reason for that is, again, that lack of rainfall we had this last winter. I was really crossing my fingers hoping we'd get a good season, but again, it was about 50% of average, about 85% of California in that extreme drought category. And another way to look at that is the research that we actually do at the Fire Weather Research Laboratory. We go up into the mountains we trim plants, we do chemise and manzanita, we trim plants into a paint can, you weigh it, you put it into an oven for 24 hours, it evaporates all the moisture out of the plant, and then you weigh it again, and based on the difference in weight, it tells you how much moisture or water was in that plant. And just to summarize this chart right here, that green line shows where those average values are. Since we started this fuel moisture data set in 2009, the red line was our previous record low values, and that blue line is this season. So we started doing these fuel sampling, fuel sample, this fuel sampling data set in 2009, where again, we go up into the mountains twice a month to three different sites, and we collect five different paint cans of fuel. So it's a large amount of data that we're collecting. And you can see that since really May into June, we've been seeing drier fuels than in the history of when in the history of this data set. So record low fuels, and again, this isn't just our fire weather research lab showing this. I know another of other labs are showing record low fuel moistures as well. And again, that's been playing a big role when it comes to really all of the fires that we've been seeing. And it gave us a good indication early on that it was going to be a tricky fire season. So Again, if we click on the structures for the McFarland fire, you can see that town of Wildwood right there. That looks to be the largest amount of structures around this area. So I imagine they have a lot of resources right in that area, working as hard as they can to protect that spot and then to also try to protect or stop this fire from going any more to the northwest where you see another section of structures. I wonder if we can actually see what town that is it eh, doesn't really look like it wants to show a town that is but one other thing that i thought was interesting that they say somewhere in here again it's a lot of information so can't find it right now but good thing i just remember what they said they said that this is an area that hasn't burned in 50 years so if it might be easier to see if we zoom out here for a second you can see very large amount of fires have happened around this area, but directly where the McFarland fire is, no fires burned there in about 50 years. So again, that's another big reason we're seeing the rapid growth that we're seeing. One, the fuels are very dry, but two, there's just a very large amount of fuels because it's just been accumulating for the last 50 years. Now, the good news there 
is as we often see with our fires, as they start to bump into some of these other fires, it almost, in some cases, it just stops it in its tracks. And looks like that might actually already start, is starting to play a role on the southern edge here where it looks like it's bumping into, I, sometimes the labeling on these fires is wrong. So I don't want to say that that's the Bramlett fire from 2010, but it looks like it's bumping into that fire perimeter right there. And we're seeing less hot spots on that area right there. So it looks like it's starting to slow down. Hopefully that continues to slow down as it starts to bump into some of these other fires as well. So overall, when it comes to the McFarland fire, um, we've seen a large amount of growth over the last couple of days, very steep terrain, tricky fire weather conditions, and record dry fuels in the area. So seen a lot of activity, most likely going to continue to see a lot of activity, and we do have some evacuation orders in place. Now, before we look at the fire weather forecast for that one, let's just examine some of the other fires going on throughout this region because I'm just going to combine their fire weather forecast together. It looks like it's relatively similar, so just in the interest of time, we're going to combine them together. The fire just north of there is the Monument Fire, and you can see that there's, we had a lot of activity on this one over the last 24 hours. The easiest way to see that is just how many of those hot spots you see outside of the previous day's fire perimeter. And it looks like we had a lot of growth in the same areas that we saw in the McFarland fire as well. A lot of growth on that northwestern section there and that southeastern section as well. I know one problem they're having with the Monument fire is because there's so much smoke in the area, again, some of that smoke being generated by the McFarland fire just south of it. So as it kicks up all that smoke, it reduces the ability to use aircraft, which reduces your ability to fight these fires, especially when they're in such tricky terrain and the aircraft is critical on, on fires like this. So again, looks like most of that growth on the northwestern section of the Monument fire. If we want to see the numbers on that one, it looks like it's up to 17,622 acres. And with this fire, again, there are some evacuation orders in place, and we are currently at 0% containment. And again, part of the struggle with this fire as well, we've got the McFarland fire, the Dixie fire, Antelope fire, River fire. So you notice how small that total personnel number is right there. Hopefully we'll see that come up over the next couple of days as our resources are being spread relatively thin due to the large amount of fires that are all going on at the exact same time. And just key thing that sticks out to me is temperatures today were in the low 100s. So that's where that critical fire weather aspect comes in and relative humidity was about 10 to 14%. So you can really see the impacts that fire weather has on these fires when it's hot and dry. And we saw this over the last couple of days with both the McFarland fire and the Monument fire. It was really those hot and dry conditions that really picked these fires up. Now we can also go up to the Summer Fire and the Hay Press Fire. Again, I don't think, we'll see if this works yesterday. Yeah, the acreage burned on these. You can see they're still not drawing fire perimeters around these yet. So again, the acreage burned on those will be updated once they get an official fire perimeter on those. But as of right now, it looks like we've had a large amount of growth over the last 24 hours on both the summer fire and the hay press fire. So I'm certainly going to be interested to see what those numbers are once they actually figure out what those perimeters are. But the other fire that we can see going on in our satellite imagery, and this was one of the more active fires throughout the day today, the antelope fire up in the very northern parts of California. Again, I think you can see how active this one was throughout the day today, but especially by looking at the natural color fire, where you can see, especially as we get into the afternoon hours where it gets hotter, drier, and windier, you see how bright that fire is, how much fire activity we're seeing on that one. And when it comes, actually we'll, we'll look at the fire perimeter on that one. Looks like they don't have the perimeter drawn yet. It's just like the summer fire and hay press fire where we don't have that official perimeter drawn around it yet. But you can see where a lot of that activity has been, looks like it's getting closer to tenant. And if we look here, it should say evacuation orders 
Yes, evacuation order has been issued for the county of Tennant. Looks like a number of other evacuation orders as well. But when it comes to the Antelope Fire, again, it doesn't look like we have any official acreage on this one yet. So that's why I'm covering all of these fires relatively fast, especially compared to the Dixie Fires. There's just not all that much information coming out yet, but I'm looking every single day to try to find more resources so I can try to make better reports for you guys and really get that important information out there. But personnel, we do have that information. It's about 275 personnel on this fire. And again, this is one area that is covered in that red flag warning. So now let's really get to the fire weather forecast. I'm just going to kind of combine these fires together because just in the interest of time and there's not that big of differences. Basically, the fire weather forecast in a sense continued hot, dry, windy conditions over the next 24 hours. And the reason for that, and or actually we'll go back a second, these fires, most of them were not even on our radar a number of days ago, and then it was this high pressure system that brought very hot, dry air, and that really allowed these fires to flare up over the last two to three days. And you can just see how much of activity that we're seeing throughout this afternoon when we're combining those warm, dry conditions with some with an increase in wind gusts as well. But then, and the, to explain the wind gusts, you can see that still have that high pressure system over much of California, so it's still hot and dry. And then we had this low pressure system coming through, bringing those stronger wind gusts with it. And unfortunately, wasn't bringing all that much moisture with it. You'd think that a low pressure system coming through might be able to bring some rainfall, but really just brought some strong winds. Part of the reason we saw our fires really start to pick up this afternoon. And again, I say there wasn't that much moisture with it, and you can actually see it on this map. You can see how dry it was over California over much of the last couple of days. And then as that low pressure system comes through here, you can see that little circle up there. That's the center of the low where we do have a little bit of moisture. So possibly some of that could find its way into Antelope. I'm certainly hoping that's the case, but you can see for much of California, it's a very dry, cold front. So that's really one of the worst things you could have for a fire because it's the negatives of a cold front coming through and the fact that you get stronger wind gusts, but none of the positives where you'd hopefully be getting some moisture with it. So. That's the big story throughout this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon, but there is some good news. I always try to find some good news in these forecasts. On the back end of this low pressure system, it looks like we will have a brief time where some moisture is able to find its way into Northern California, which is going to create some very favorable conditions as we get into Thursday night, where firefighters will hopefully be able to get a good handle on these blazes. But as we get farther into the forecast, you can see there's a couple little strips of moisture that go through through Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But then as we get into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week, we return to a very warm, dry pattern. So hopefully that this isn't just a rerun of what we saw last week where we had some moisture coming through the state and fires calm down. And then it switches to that warm, dry pattern and the fires just flare right back up again. But... When it comes to the overall fire weather forecast, I think this sums it up well. As that cold front comes to, comes through, that is some of the good news is while it's not bringing any that much moisture to us, it is bringing cooler temperatures. We're in, again, we looked at one report where it said the low triple digits throughout the day today, and it looks like tomorrow, much cooler conditions expected, just around 85 degrees. But you see those afternoon wind gusts pick up as that low comes through. That just shows winds getting up to about 13 right there but if your sustained winds are 13 you're most likely going to be seeing some gusts around 15 to 25 miles per hour overall i'd say winds don't look as strong for these fires as they look in the dixie fire area dixie fire i think has the most critical fire weather conditions over the next 24 hours you can see how dry it is throughout the overnight hours tonight. Again, that's something we talked about earlier where you usually like to see your overnight hours look like that where it gets up to 77% relative humidity. It gives the firefighters a good chance to get a good control over the blaze. But as you saw, as that low pressure system first, we'll just, as the low pressure system first comes through, 
it's just bringing some dry air along with it. And then on the back end, it looks like it's bringing a little bit of moisture in. You can see the effect that will have on the relative humidity tomorrow night. So that is the part of the forecast. I'd say overall, still worried for tomorrow's forecast. We're still relatively warm. We have those afternoon wind gusts. Looks like it's coming from a, a more northwesterly direction as that low comes through. And we still have, looks like some moisture, a little bit more than in previous days, but certainly still on the dry end. So certainly still concerned for tomorrow afternoon, but looks like tomorrow night, we're going to start to see a little relief in this area as temperatures drop down into the 50s, wind gusts drop down in the overnight hours, and our relative humidity goes up to 77%. So really looking forward to Thursday night into early Friday morning as it looks like the back end of that low pressure system will actually be bringing a little moisture into the very northwestern parts of California. What I'm hoping is some of that can find its way into the Dixie Fire area as well, but in a lot of that Dixie Fire area, it, it seems to just remain dry there 24 hours a day. So this, you can see, looks like this gets close to some of those fires. We can actually turn it on on this map to see what fires are covered in that red flag warning because that's pretty critical. Anytime you have a red flag warning when you already have fires in place, it gives you a good idea that you're going to see an increase in fire behavior. It looks like the Dixie fire is covered in that red flag warning. It looks like the, where's the antelope fire? We had a trouble finding this yesterday too. It looks like the antelope fire is actually out of that red flag warning now. So that's some good news there. And it looks like when it comes to the hay press, the summer, the monument, and the McFarland fires, those appear to be out of the red flag warning as well. So again, not as bad as it could be when it comes to their fire weather conditions, but certainly tricky conditions over the Dixie fire over the next 24 hours. So again, with the, with the red flag warning in place over the Dixie, very, actually this map right here has it over the Antelope fire area. So I would trust the National Weather Service over whatever other website we were just looking at. If the National Weather Service says there's a red flag warning till 9 p.m. on Thursday over what looks to be the Antelope fire area, then I would say it's safe to say, ah, that's close. I, I think there's a red flag warning. I'm going to double check that and get make sure to include that in tomorrow's forecast. And I'm hopefully going to be doing it in the afternoon hours. So at the most important time for this red flag warning, hopefully I will already be live tomorrow. But again, the reason that's so important, easier fire starts, potential for rapid spread of new and existing fires. So I'm going to be keeping a close eye on especially the Dixie, especially the Antelope. But anytime... It's still hot, dry, and windy throughout the, anywhere in the state. Going to be keeping a close eye on fires like the McFarland, Monument, Summer, Hay Press as well. And then finally, we're just going to take a brief look at the river fire here. I'll go back to the beginning. So you can see earlier in the day, wouldn't have even guessed there is a fire in this area. And then you can see it really start to take off this afternoon as it got hotter, drier, and windier. And let's see if it looks like it's still seeing some activity throughout the overnight hours. You can see it start to flare up right there. And then as we transition to overnight, it looks like that one has certainly calmed down more than our other fire. So again, ho hopefully that's some good news for the river fire there. Unfortunately, as you can see, couldn't find very much information on this one yet, but information usually comes out fairly fast. 24 hours within a fire really getting going so hopefully I have a large amount of information for you guys tomorrow but again that one right now it's reported at 1400 acres and zero percent contained so that's going to be one that we'll have to keep an eye on over the next couple of days as I believe that fire it there's a chance that that one's covered in that red flag warning as well I I got to figure out a way to identify exactly where these fires are in that red flag warning is because it looks, again, like the antelope would be covered in that red flag. Again, I'll take a, take a good look at that to see if I can figure that out. So, again, when it comes to all our fires, there's a large amount of them going on right now. Big reason that's a problem is because that starts to spread our resources more thin. Just looking at it again on the satellite imagery, you can see 
Dixie Fire, lots of activity, especially on that northwestern section of the fire and the northeastern section around Greenville. That's possibly the top priority right now as we have some new evacuation orders in place in the last few hours. We've seen some of those flames get back into Greenville and they're actively trying to get people out of that area as of right now. So lots of activity going on there throughout the day and you can just see large amounts of activity throughout much of California with McFarland Fire, Monument Fire, Summer, Hay Press, Antelope, and now the new one, the River Fire as well. So when it comes to these fires, I'm planning on doing a full update and forecast tomorrow afternoon. I'm hoping to do it around 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. I'm hoping to do a more extended forecast so we can really follow these fires in real time. Just based on the satellite imagery, you can see how they really pick up, especially in the afternoon hours. So I'm hoping to do an update and forecast during the afternoon hours tomorrow so we can follow it in real time. And if you want, if you want to stay updated on that and really for all the major wildfires for the rest of the 2021 season, you can click the subscribe button to this channel and then you can also click the notification bell as well where it'll actually send you a notification when I go live. And that could be important tomorrow because with that red flag warning in place, I think tomorrow afternoon is going to be a very important time to stay updated on all these fires. So as always, my thoughts and prayers go out to everyone who has been affected by these wildfires and a huge thank you to all the firefighters out there working around the clock to keep all of us, our lives and our structures safe. So big thank you and overall I hope that this video was helpful and I'll see you guys tomorrow when we check back in on all these fires that are going on. Again, hope you have a good night and I'll see you guys tomorrow.